speaker today, as you know, is um, Brent Pym of McGill University, and he will tell us about holonomic Poisson manifolds. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, and um, thanks for that nice tribute to uh, Kirill. I, uh, I only had a chance to meet him once, but I can certainly echo everybody's uh, comments about his kindness. So I'm going to speak today about uh, a topic which I had been planning to speak about at the Poisson Conference this summer. Um, so I, I want to thank the organizers also for getting this seminar going so that we still can see each other. It's been, been really nice. So this is based on some uh, joint work with, which started from a conversation with Travis Shedler at the 2016 Poisson meeting and then got a shot in the arm when I talked to Mikola Matvichok at the 2018 meeting. This is a topic about uh, holo holonomic Poisson manifolds. Uh, holonomicity is a kind of new non-degeneracy condition for Poisson structures, which uh, arises naturally from some considerations involving D modules. It's very much in keeping with the spirit of recent generalizations of uh, symplectic geometry, such as B symplectic and log symplectic manifolds, which have been popularized by Gilliman, Miranda, Pires, and Gualtieri, Lee, and others. Um, it's somehow a slightly more general notion in that uh, a lot of the time when we work with these B and log symplectic manifolds, there are some pretty strong smoothness assumptions. And holonomicity allows for some rather complicated singularities that allows us to, to treat more natural examples coming in algebraic geometry. And on the other hand, things are somehow tame enough that the deformation theory of these Poisson structures often turns out to be quite tractable. Um, and just before I get started, I should say that everything that we're going to say here um, very much is inspired by the work earlier of Ettingov and Shedler using D modules to study Poisson traces, particularly on symplectic varieties, as well as uh, Kaleidon and Namikawa's work on the structure of uh, symplectic singularities. Okay, so wh what is the setting? I'm going to be working with a complex manifold X uh, equipped with a holomorphic Poisson structure. So the notation that I'm going to use is that the wedge T is always going to denote the sheaf of holomorphic polyvector fields. So a holomorphic Poisson structure is a section of wedge two of this sheaf. Uh, so that's uh, the sheaf cohomology H naught of wedge two TX. And it satisfies the usual integrability condition that it's scouting brackets with itself, which is a holomorphic trivector is equal to zero. So for the avoidance of doubt, this is a tensor of type 2, 0. If I write things in local holomorphic coordinates zi, then the bivector is a combination of the coordinate derivatives del zi, del zj, uh, with holomorphic functions as coefficients, so there are no z bars appearing anywhere. Okay, the, the problem that is kind of motivating the discussion today is, uh, is that of trying to classify uh, complex Poisson manifolds. So what are the possible pairs up to isomorphism? Well, this is a completely hopeless problem. There are far too many of them. But at least we can say that they're isomorphism classes, at least when X is compact, they're all organized into a moduli space, which parameterizes the isomorphism classes. And this moduli space has some kind of decomposition into irreducible components. Uh, each of these components corresponds to some qualitatively distinct family of Poisson manifolds, for instance, distinguished by their topology. So for example, um, Poisson structures on the projective plane form an irreducible component of this moduli space. And Poisson structures on projective three space form six irreducible components of this moduli space. And even for projective spaces of higher dimension, there's relatively little known about the classification. Uh, more on that at the end of the talk. So the classification problem is largely hopeless, but slightly more tractable thing is to pick your favorite Poisson manifold and try to describe a neighborhood of the corresponding point in the moduli space. So in other words, take the Poisson manifold and deform it. So I don't need to tell this audience that deformations of Poisson manifolds are governed by Poisson cohomology, but I want to review that slightly because I want to use a certain perspective on the problem, uh, which is going to motivate the definition of holonomicity. So remember the Poisson cohomology is uh, given by this complex where you take the polyvector fields and you uh, turn on a differential, which is given by uh, the Scouten bracket with the Poisson bivector. So that raises the degree of a polyvector by one, which squares to zero. 
So uh, for instance, if you want to look at uh, deformations locally, so take a point in this Poisson manifold and try to deform the germ of the Poisson structure at that point, well, what do you do? Well, you start with your Poisson pi vector and now you turn it into a family parameterized by some variable t. Now, so uh, you add it as a power series in t and say the leading term will be the germ of some bivector vector at this point. Now you want the integrability condition to remain true, so you need the scouting bracket of pi t with itself to vanish, but if you expand this out as a power series in t, the leading order term vanishes because pi is Poisson and the, the next term is exactly the differential of this bivector eta in this complex. So the condition at first order to have a deformation is simply that eta is a co-cycle for this complex. And on the other hand, when is a deformation trivial? Well, that would mean that I could get my family by applying a family of diffeomorphisms to the original pi vector pi. And at first order in T, that corresponds to the statement that this uh, pi vector eta is the lead derivative of pi along some vector field. So the upshot is that uh, first order deformations of uh, the Poisson structure are given by uh, co-cycles modulo co-boundaries in this complex. So the first order deformations of the germ up to isomorphism are parameterized by the cohomology of the stock of this complex, so the stock cohomology. I want to contrast this with the global picture where we deform uh, x pi as a global Poisson manifold. So in addition to deforming the bivector as a global Poisson bivector field, we could uh, also deform the complex structure or more generally the generalized complex structure of X. So one way to think about this is that you start with a local picture, you have a deformation on some open set, which is described by the construction on the left-hand side. Uh, and then you need to glue these together on overlaps. So um, that somehow involves gluing by these symmetries which are uh, vector fields on overlaps. And when the dust settles, what you see is that the first order deformations of the global pair X pi is governed by the second hypercohomology of this complex. Okay, so here um, hypercohomology is some mixture of the sheaf cohomology of the polyvectors and the Poisson differential. You can use any model that you like to compute this hypercohomology. The, Motivation here was somehow using a check model where I cover X by open sets, but you could equally well use the Dolbo resolution or the Tom Sullivan resolution. There are any number of choices you can make and it doesn't matter, you'll always get the same answer. Now, the point that I wanna make is that whether or not you're concerned with local or global deformations, uh, the relevant cohomology, it only depends on this complex of sheaves up to quasi isomorphism of complexes of sheaves. So in other words, it only depends on the Poisson complex as an object in the derived category of X. Um, and furthermore, if you want to understand not just the first order deformations, but actually deformations to all orders, well, what you can do is uh, use the Scouten bracket on polyvector fields to induce uh, an L infinity structure on the cohomology, some sequence of higher bracket operations which you can then assemble to define a nonlinear obstruction map, which goes from the first order deformation space H2 to uh, the cohomology H3. And then the, the first order deformations, which extend to all orders are the ones which lie in the zero locus of this obstruction. map. So this is all quite standard. Uh, let me just uh, explain how this plays out in the standard examples. So uh, at the extreme case, we could consider a Poisson manifold, which is non-degenerate. So it's given by a holomorphic symplectic manifold, which means that in a local chart, I can always find Darboux coordinates so that the Poisson structure is described in terms of the usual P's and Q's. So they all look the same locally. Now, non-degeneracy is an open condition on a matrix or, or a, a tensor. So if I deform this structure a little bit, it will remain non-degenerate. And as a consequence, the Darboux coordinates will still be valid. So in other words, uh, locally, the deformations must be all trivial. There's no change to the local structure of the Poisson manifold. 
So this is reflect, reflected cohomologically in the following statement. So the polyvector fields, if I have a symplectic structure, I can use the symplectic two form to convert a polyvector field into a differential form. And when I do that, the Poisson differential on polyvectors, it corresponds to the Duram differential, the ordinary Duram differential on forms. But uh, we understand the cohomology of forms very well. Uh, for instance, there's the Poincaré lemma, which tells us that locally everything is contractible. So this complex of sheaves is actually equivalent to an ordinary sheaf sitting as a complex in degree zero, uh, which is the constant sheaf on the X. Um, and moreover, if you trace what's happening with the, the Skouten bracket, you see that the bracket on the constant sheaf is just identically equal to zero. So this is an abelian sheaf. Um, so the Poincaré lemma tells us in particular that the second cohomology is equal to zero, which reflects the fact that the deformations are locally trivial. And the second hypercohomology is then just the ordinary cohomology of the constant sheaf, which is the second cohomology of X, say the singular cohomology of X with complex coefficients. So um, this is reflecting the fact, of course, that the symplectic two form has a cohomology class, which is a non-trivial parameter. And uh, the fact that the, uh, the Lie bracket is abelian, it tells you that uh, the L-infinity structure on cohomology has to vanish identically, so all deformations are unobstructed. This is a variant of the bogomolov tian todorov unobstructedness theorem for uh, deformations of Calabi-L. Okay, so that's uh, quite a simple picture. Everything is topological. At the opposite extreme, if the bivector is equal to zero, then, uh, well, we can't say very much at all because locally, any germ of a Poisson structure can be viewed as a deformation of the zero Poisson structure just by rescaling. Um, so cohomologically, the differential is equal to zero, which means that the cohomology sheaves of the polyvector fields are just the polyvector fields themselves. And in particular, um, they have infinite dimensional stocks, very much in contrast to what was happening in the symplectic case. And furthermore, the higher order deformations are going to be highly obstructed in general. Now, in between these two cases, we could look at the case of uh, Poisson surface. So there's a two dimensional complex manifold, the bivector being a section of wedge two of the tangent bundle. That's a section of the anti-canonical line bundle, the determinant of the tangent bundle. And since we're working in the complex setting, if it vanishes, this tensor must vanish on a curve, which I'm going to denote by uh, the boundary of X. Although it's not the topological boundary, it behaves cohomologically in many ways like a boundary. Uh, so this is an anti-canonical divisor in this surface. Um, and the complement of this anti-canonical divisor is a symplectic manifold. The Poisson structure is non-degenerate. And I also want to allow the possibility that uh, this uh, curve, uh, boundary of X, has a singular locus, which I'll denote boundary squared. So here's a rough picture. I have this blue open dense symplectic leaf. I have the red curve. And then I have um, the singular locus of this curve, which I've drawn as this green dot. Now, if we look at what's happening with the Poisson cohomology, well, in the blue locus, the symplectic locus, we already saw what's going on. Everything is locally trivial. The cohomology is concentrated in degree zero. On the other hand, if we look at uh, the smooth locus of this curve, well, it turns out that there's still a standard normal form, which you get by linearizing the Poisson structure. And uh, here, again, the zeroth cohomology is just uh, the constant functions on X. Uh, but now, actually, you appears a first cohomology class, which is represented by a vector field, that, which is uh, Weinstein's modular vector field. So this is a vector field, uh, which in coordinates is just del Z, and it's transverse to the symplectic leaves inside uh, the zero locus of the Poisson tensor. And finally, we can look at the singular point, and there, there's not so much we can say about the normal form. What we can say for sure is that the Poisson bivector will have to be a multiple of the coordinate bivector by some holomorphic function. And just for simplicity of exposition, let me assume that this uh, function is a quasi-homogeneous polynomial, although that restriction can be removed at the cost of a more complicated result. 
Um, so what, what's going on with the cohomology? Well, uh, again, the zeroth cohomology is just the constants. And now the first cohomology is a little bit more complicated. Um, I should have said before that even when you look in a smooth point, you can interpret this cohomology class given by this vector field Z as somehow being dual to a loop which wraps around this divisor. And, and the same thing is going on at the singular point. So the first cohomology is then described by taking a small ball around this uh, singular point, B epsilon, intersecting it with a symplectic locus and taking the first cohomology of that, uh, that space. Now, if, uh, if the curve has many different branches coming into this point, then the first cohomology can have uh, quite high dimension, but at least it will always be finite dimensional. And uh, with the second cohomology, things are even more complicated. So in addition to the possibility of uh, deforming the symplectic form on the complement of this curve, which is measured by the second cohomology of this, uh, this open piece, there's the possibility that we can take this curve and we can try to smooth out its singularities, say something like this. So we can deform the curve itself. And so that contributes some additional uh, directions in H2. And the upshot of this is that in the derived category, this uh, sheaf of poly vector fields decomposes as a direct sum of two pieces. There's a piece coming from the open symplectic leaf, which is the push forward of the constant sheaf. And that's what gives rise to this cohomology of the complement here. And then there's a second piece which contributes these smoothings. It's a skyscraper sheaf, which is supported at the singular points. And so the global hypercohomology, it decomposes into two pieces. There's the cohomology of the complement, which is the symplectic thing. And then there's this additional contribution in degree two, which is coming from the smoothings of the, of the curve. And you can check in this case that actually all the obstructions vanish. So we have quite a good picture for the, for the deformations of uh, Poisson surfaces. So what we're seeing in these examples is uh, that there are different levels of finite dimensionality which you could ask for for the deformation space. Uh, so the simplest thing would be to require that this uh, hypercohomology H2 is finite dimensional. So that would be saying globally the deformation space is a finite dimensional space. Um, actually, that's not a very strong constraint when you're working in complex geometry because the, the complex is elliptic. And so this condition is actually automatic as soon as the manifold X is compact. There's something stronger which you could ask for, um, which would be that even locally, uh, the cohomology is, is finite dimensional. So if you want to build up the global deformation space H2, you need the local deformation space H2, but you also need the gluings, which are given by H1, and then there's some maybe twisting in H0. Um, so if you require all of those to be finite dimensional and you make some finiteness hypothesis on the topology of X, then that will imply the global deformation space is finite dimensional. But it's a stronger thing. It's saying that you can glue the global deformations out of kind of finitely many gluing parameters, even locally. And if you take this to its logical conclusion, you could ask for the entire cohomology locally to be finite dimensional. So the stocks of the cohomology sheaves to be finite dimensional. And this somehow corresponds to requiring not just that the local deformation spaces are finite dimensional, but they're finite dimensional even at the derived level. So if you allow deformations that are parameterized by some uh, non-trivial uh, DG algebras. So the question that I want to address is, when is it the case that uh, the stocks of this Poisson cohomology complex are finite dimensional? So when are the local derived deformation spaces finite dimensional? Are there any questions at this point? What do you mean by local derived? Will you always consider a compact uh, X or uh, I'm not always going to consider compact X. No, it could be, it could be general. Uh, so this is just uh, local derived is uh, essentially a philosophical point. I'm just saying that um, I want to require all the cohomology to be finite dimensional, not just uh, the degree two part. But there's a precise thing you can say, which is that the cohomology in higher degrees corresponds to some deformations over some derived base. 
Yeah, also a uh, question. So uh, when you talk about these deformations of Poisson structures, let's say in symplectic case, you also, uh, this includes deformations of complex structures, right? That's right. But only ones that are compatible with some Poisson deformation that's important. I couldn't quite hear that, uh, but you only consider, yeah, you consider only deformations of the complex structure which are compatible with deformations of the bivector. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, the next slide. So the, I'm, I'm asking this question, when are the stocks of the cohomology sheaves finite dimensional? Well, there's a standard toolbox for answering this kind of question in algebraic geometry, which is the theory of D modules. Let me just explain quickly what it tells you to do in this particular setting. So remember, uh, dx is the sheaf of differential operators acting on holomorphic functions. Uh, so differential operators of finite order, and uh, this uh, sheaf is a sheaf of algebras, which carries a filtration by the order of differential operators. And uh, the associated graded of the filtration, by taking the symbol of, uh, of a differential operator, gives you the symmetric algebra on the vector fields which I want to think of as the polynomial functions on the cotangent bundle. So now um, what you do is you start with a Poisson complex and you uh, tensor it with this algebra dx. And in that way you produce a complex of right modules over this sheaf of algebras. Um, formally, this, uh, this complex consists of differential operators which go from OX, the holomorphic functions, to polyvectors. And then there's a right action of dx by precomposition of differential operators. And there's a left action because the Poisson differential is a differential operator. And uh, then what you can do is take this complex, it has a filtration. And so you can consider it's associated graded, which is now a quasi coherent sheaf on the cotangent bundle. And you take the support of this uh, complex and you get a subvariety in the cotangent bundle of X, which turns out always to be uh, coisotropic. And it's uh, furthermore invariant under rescaling of the cotangent fibers. So this thing is called the characteristic variety of the Poisson manifold. This is something which makes sense for any complex of D modules. I'm just specializing it to the case of a Poisson manifold. And uh, the definition is that a Poisson manifold is holonomic if uh, this characteristic variety, which is always coisotropic, is actually Lagrangian. So it has the smallest possible dimension of a coisotropic subvariety. So I want to encourage you to think of this as a kind of non-degeneracy condition. There are some equations which cut out this variety. And uh, when we say that it's Lagrangian, we're saying that the variety is as small as possible. So the equations are somehow as independent from one another as could possibly be the case. Okay, so this was the, the definition which, we, which Travis and I proposed. Uh, it's just use, adopting the holonomic terminology from D modules in the special case of a Poisson manifold. Uh, so again, it's a, this characteristic variety is a, is a subvariety in the cotangent bundle, which is canonically associated to any uh, Poisson manifold. And the, the Poisson structure is holonomic if this is a Lagrangian. So the reason we introduced this definition is that from the theory of D modules, you get some immediate consequences. So the first one is a consequence of the general Kashiwara constructability theorem, which uh, tells you that when this thing is holonomic, the cohomology sheaves that we were discussing earlier will automatically have uh, finite dimensional stocks. In fact, it seems to essentially be equivalent to the finite dimensionality. Um, there's a slightly stronger statement that you can make once you account for some information about the projective dimension of D modules due to Roos, which says that the Poisson complex is up to a shift in degree, what's known as a perverse sheaf. So what this means is that uh, the manifold X, it has a Whitney stratification. So it's a decomposition into locally closed submanifolds X alpha. This decomposition is uh, locally finite, so there are only finitely many of these submanifolds in the neighborhood of any point. And then uh, the characteristic variety is written as the union of the closures of the co-normal bundles of these strata X alpha. And the key point about the strata is that the cohomology sheaves are not just finite dimensional, 
they're actually locally constant along all of the strata. And moreover, there's a condition on the supports, uh, which roughly speaking says that the cohomology of high degree only appears in high co-dimension. So more precisely, if I look at the kth cohomology sheaf, its support is a subvariety of co-dimension at least k. So this is exactly what we saw for surfaces, remember. We saw that H0 was everywhere. H1 appeared when you looked at the curve, and H2 appeared at the singular points of the curve. Okay, some other fairly immediate consequences of the definition is uh, further evidence that holonomacy is a kind of non-degeneracy condition. So uh, first of all, uh, it's a local condition on the singularities of the Poisson structure. So if I want to know that the manifold is holonomic, it's enough to uh, look at the germs at every point. And in fact, it only depends on what's going on in the directions transverse to the symplectic leaf. So uh, it's really a condition on the local singularities of the Poisson manifold. And uh, furthermore, it's an open condition in, in proper families. So if I have a family of compact, um, compact pos complex Poisson manifolds and uh, a generic, uh, then one, and one of the fibers is holonomic, then the generic fiber will be holonomic. So put differently, um, I have this moduli space of Poisson manifolds, which I alluded to in an early slide, and the, uh, the holonomic Poisson manifolds, they will form a Zariski open set in the moduli space. So for instance, if you're inter just interested in finding irreducible components of this moduli space, it's enough to find uh, irreducible components of the holonomic locus. You take their closure, you'll get an irreducible component in the moduli space of all Poisson structures. Sorry, I, I, I couldn't uh, make that out. You were garbled. Travis, your sound is not, uh, is not legible. You said uh, that there could be some components that have no holonomic uh, members. Oh, absolutely. There are lots of components which have no holonomic members. Uh, the holonomicity is kind of a special thing, but anyways, it, it's a source of many components. Okay, I should have made that clear. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. Can you give us an example um, or two of what this characteristic variety is um, so we can keep something in mind, um, in particular, the holonomic case? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting to that right now. Thanks, Alan. Okay. So, um, Alan's asking what this characteristic variety actually looks like, uh, and somehow that's the core problem that we've been trying to understand. Um, so here's a lemma, which will hopefully give you a sense. So one easy way to get a Lagrangian submanifold in the cotangent bundle of a Poisson manifold is to take a symplectic leaf and take its co-normal bundle. Okay. Now if I take the union of the co-normal bundles of all the symplectic leaves, that will give me a co-isotropic subvariety. And what I claim is that the characteristic variety sits inside the union of the conormals. Okay, so how do you see this? Well, um, first of all, what you observe is that Hamiltonian flows act homotopically trivially on the, the Poisson complex, essentially by the Cartan homotopy formula. And using that, what you can easily show is that uh, if you take a Hamiltonian vector field and you think of it as a function on the cotangent bundle, then that function will have to vanish on the characteristic variety. Um, okay, but the common zero set of all those functions is exactly the union of the conormal bundles of the symplectic groups. Right. So that's a, a kind of cheap set of equations for this characteristic variety, which is uh, it's always sitting in the union of the conormals. So right away, we see that a symplectic manifold is automatically hol holonomic, because in that case, there's only one symplectic leaf, which is the whole manifold. And so the conormal bundle is the zero section, which is definitely Lagrangian. Okay, so this matches our very early example, showing that the, um, the cohomology of a symplectic manifold is somehow very simple. Okay, but it's sort of easy to see that this can't possibly be the whole story because if we look at that case of a surface, 
which has a curve in it, um, and I take the union of all the co-normal bundles, well, along this curve, each uh, point is a symplectic leaf, so the co-normal space is two-dimensional. So I have a whole one-parameter family of two-dimensional subspaces in the cotangent bundle, and what I get is a threefold sitting inside the cotangent bundle. It's too big to be a Lagrangian. So indeed, whenever you have an, uh, a one-parameter family of symplectic leaves, the union of the co-normal bundles will be too big. It's not a Lagrangian. But actually, I'm going to explain that surface is still holonomic. Um, but to explain that, I need to a little bit more about the structure of this characteristic variety. So um, the characteristic variety, it sits inside the union of the co-normals of all the symplectic leaves. Uh, you may ask the opposite question. Suppose I have a symplectic leaf. When does its co-normal sit inside the characteristic variety? What I'm claiming is that it doesn't always. It's only sometimes. And um, well, here's what we can prove. So uh, a symplectic leaf is characteristic in this sense. So its co-normal lies in the characteristic variety. If and only if uh, Allen's modular vector field is tangent to that symplectic leaf. So again, in the case of a surface, on the smooth locus, uh, the modular vector field is transverse to the leaves, so you don't count those co-normal bundles as characteristic. Um, actually, we think that the characteristic leaves give us a complete uh, characterization of holonomicity. So what we can prove for sure is that if the Poisson structure is holonomic at a point, then there can only be uh, finitely many characteristic leaves in a neighborhood of that point. So the point P is contained in the closure of at most finitely many characteristic leaves. And actually we conjecture that the converse is true um, and that's supported by all the examples we know but we don't have a proof. So that would give a complete uh, characterization of holonomicity. What you need is to find a situation where the modular vector field is tangent to only finitely many symplectic leaves. Um, there are some partial converses. So for instance, if, uh, if there are finitely many orbits of symplectic leaves under the flow of the modular vector field, which is stronger than this finiteness condition, then we can prove that the structure is holonomic. Uh, and we also have a characterization of holonomicity away from a subset of co-dimension two, uh, which is to say that holonomicity away from a subset of co-dimension two is equivalent to saying that the Poisson manifold is defined by so-called log symplectic form. So let me recall what that means. A Poisson manifold is log symplectic if it has an open dense symplectic locus, which I'll denote by X circle, uh, and then the symplectic form on that locus has to have first order poles on the complement of that locus, which is always a, an anti-canonical divisor, a hypersurface in X. Okay. So uh, that's what I mean. These, these Poisson manifolds are quite special. They have to automatically have an open dense symplectic leaf and they degenerate on a hypersurface in a controlled fashion. But then um, in higher co-dimension, the holonomicity corresponds to some subtle interaction between the singularities of this uh, anti-canonical divisor and the Poisson structure. So um, some examples of holonomic Poisson manifolds. Uh, so let's again go to this case of surfaces. Um, so remember if a, we have a surface and we have this red curve where the Poisson structure vanishes and we have the green dot, which is the singular locus of this curve. And the complement of the curve is the symplectic locus, x0. Um, and so what I alluded to before is that if you look at the modular vector field of this uh, Poisson manifold, um, then it's always non-vanishing on the smooth locus of this curve. So in other words, it's transverse to the zero dimensional symplectic leaves, which lie in the smooth part of this curve. But then the modular vector field is a symmetry, so it has to preserve the singular locus of the, of the divisor. So the, it has to vanish at the singular points. So the singular points, those all give symplectic leaves that are characteristic. They're symplectic leaves for which the modular vector field is tangent. And of course, the open symplectic leaf is also characteristic in this sense, because the 
symplectic leaf is the whole space, so of course the modular vector field is tangent to it. Um, so the characteristic leaves are exactly the open locus and the singular points of this curve. And so actually this gives us a complete characterization of holonomicity for surfaces. A, a Poisson surface is holonomic if and only if uh, the singular points of this curve are isolated, which is to say that uh, the curve is reduced, meaning that every irreducible component occurs with multiplicity one, which finally is equivalent to saying that the Poisson structure is defined by a log symplectic form. So for surfaces, holonomicity is equivalent to the existence of this uh, two form with first order poles. Um, for some higher dimensional examples, uh, you can start with a surface and construct the Hilbert scheme. So remember how this goes. You start with a surface, then you can form its uh, symmetric power, sim nx, which is given by taking uh, n copies of x and modding out the action of the symmetric group. Um, so this somehow counts uh, tuples of n points in x uh, counted with multiplicity. Um, and because x carried a Poisson structure, x to the n carries a Poisson structure which is invariant under permutation. So this whole thing is a, is a Poisson variety, but it's singular. Uh, and it has a canonical resolution of singularities, which is called the Hilbert scheme, which you get by looking at uh, zero dimensional subschemes in x. Uh, this is well known to have a, a Poisson structure which lifts the one on the symmetric power. Uh, in the symplectic case, that was work of Mukai generalized to the general Poisson manifolds by Bata-Chin. And the deformations have been looked at in some cases, particularly in some works of uh, Hitchin and Ran. Um, so what can we say about these Hilbert schemes? Well, uh, the Hilbert scheme uh, of n points is holonomic, at least when the curve in the original surface is smooth. So if I ever have a Poisson surface where it, which is symplectic or has a smooth degeneracy curve, then the Hilbert scheme is holonomic. But I want to stress that um, this, uh, this uh, Hilbert scheme will have a hypersurface in it, which is extremely singular. So even though the curve here was smooth, uh, this, uh, this is a highly singular uh, Poisson structure. It's still holonomic. Um, we don't quite know exactly when it will be holonomic, but for Hilb2, we have a converse. Uh, so the Hilb2 will be holonomic if and only if the singularities of this uh, curve in X are always of type AK. So these are the, the singularities which look like um, uh, Y squared plus uh, Z to the power K plus one. Okay, so Hilbert schemes give a very natural source of holonomic Poisson manifolds. Uh, another source of these things is the so-called elliptic Poisson structures uh, of Fagan Odesky. So these are um, Poisson structures on moduli spaces of bundles over elliptic curves. And these moduli spaces turn out to be isomorphic to a projective space. So um, there's a whole family of these things which depends on some parameters. There are, there are integers D and R, which correspond to degrees and ranks of some bundles in the moduli problem. Uh, there's an elliptic curve E, where the bundles live. And there's a vector field zeta, which acts as a kind of scale factor. Um, so it's expected that these will all give irreducible components in the moduli space, but I think it's only known in a handful of cases. Um, in our first paper, Travis and I looked at these in the particular case when D is odd. That's necessary for holonomicity because uh, you need the thing to be generically symplectic, which means that the space needs to be even dimensional. Um, in the particular case also where r is equal to one, we were able to show that these Poisson structures are holonomic. Uh, and then we were actually able to completely calculate the deformation space and show that they do indeed give irreducible components of the moduli space. So these are giving uh, two-dimensional components of the moduli space depending on two parameters, which are the, the elliptic curve and this vector field on the curve. Okay, so, so these are some examples of uh, holonomic Poisson manifolds. Um, for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on a kind of case study 
which is uh, the case when the degeneracy divisor has relatively simple singularities, which are uh, normal crossings. So uh, this case has been looked at in some papers of Wren in some, in some special cases. Um, we're gonna explain now the general picture. So let's suppose that we have a log symplectic manifold. So it's a generically symplectic Poisson manifold and has a, a two form, which has poles on an anti-canonical divisor, which I'll denote by, again, by boundary of X. Um, so I'm gonna assume now that this boundary X is a simple normal crossings divisor. So recall what that means. First of all, it means that every irreducible component is smooth. And second of all, it means that when I intersect components, the intersections are always transverse. So they give submanifolds of X. Uh, the connected components are called the normal crossings strata. And uh, these are automatically Poisson submanifolds in X. So here's a typical picture of a normal crossings divisor. We have three planes in C3. They're all meeting pairwise transversally along these blue lines. And then uh, the triple intersection is the origin, it's this red dot, which is also a transverse intersection. We have a Poisson structure which has poles on a hypersurface that looks something like this. So the, the symplectic form has poles, not the Poisson structure. Um, okay, so uh, what do these things look like locally? Well, there's a quite a simple normal form, which is uh, as follows. So let's pick one of these strata, which is given by intersecting components. And uh, let me look at the open part of that stratum, which doesn't include any of the other components. Okay. So this S naught is a locally closed submanifold in X, whose closure is the intersection of these components. Uh, and then there's a simple normal form for, the, for this uh, symplectic form omega. So you can find some kind of Darboux coordinates, P and Q. It looks like the ordinary Darboux form, except uh, instead of a DQ, I have a DQ over Q, or in other words, this is D log of QI, which is where the log term comes from. Uh, so this is something like a Poisson structure on a cotangent bundle, but it has this, this kind of log poles. So it's a Poisson structure on a logarithmic analog of the cotangent bundle. And then um, there are also some additional terms which are kind of like the magnetic terms that appeared in, in Allen's talk. So uh, these Q variables, you can also combine them, dQi over QI wedge dQj over QJ with some coefficients bij. And no matter what coefficients you put there, this will always be non-degenerate. And uh, these constant coefficients have a nice topological interpretation as uh, periods of the symplectic form. So we have this two form which has poles on the anti-canonical divisor. What we can do is uh, take the two components, uh, i and j of this divisor, which uh, intersect along the stratum S naught. And I can consider a, a two torus, which uh, one factor of the torus wraps around the first component, the other factor wraps around the other component. So that gives me a two torus, which is sitting in the open symplectic part of this manifold. And so I can simply take the period of the, of the two form over that uh, two torus. And that will give me a complex number, Bij which by the residue theorem is exactly the coefficient appearing here up to some factors of two pi i. Uh, okay, so I, I should add a caveat here, which is I use this word uh, stable as a stable local normal form. So it's not quite true that um, the Poisson structure or the symplectic form is literally equal to this one. Rather, since we only care about what's going on in the directions transverse to the symplectic leaves, for the analysis, we're free to add and subtract copies of symplectic manifolds as factors. And so if I allow myself that freedom, which is kind of a stable equivalence rather than strict isomorphism, then every uh, log symplectic manifold is stably equivalent 
to this logarithmic cotangent bundle with a magnetic term. Okay. And now you see the local normal form is completely controlled by the periods of the symplectic form in the, in the open symplectic part. And so everything that we want to know ought to be answerable by uh, these, uh, these numbers B, I, J. So for instance, uh, I told you that the strata are Poisson submanifolds. Um, well, uh, if they're Poisson submanifolds, then it means that they carry their own Poisson structure. And I can ask, what is the rank of the Poisson structure in that submanifold? Or it's a little bit better to ask about the co-rank, which is the difference between the dimension of the stratum and the rank of pi. And that turns out to be exactly equal to the co-rank of this skew symmetric matrix B, I, J. So it's just some linear algebra of the coefficients. Um, so that tells you the dimension of the symplectic leaves inside this uh, the stratum. The dimension is constant equal to uh, uh, the dimension of S naught minus the co-rank of this matrix. Uh, and we can also ask the question, you know, when are the symplectic leaves in the stratum characteristic in the sense that I was talking about before? So when do they, when do their co-normal bundles lie in the characteristic variety or equivalently, when is the modular vector field tangent to the symplectic leaves? This also has a simple characterization. You just calculate the modular vector field in these coordinates and you see that um, it will be tangent to the symplectic leaves if and only if this kind of funny condition is satisfied, which is the vector whose entries are all one lies in the image of this matrix Bij. Essentially, it's because when you compute the modular vector field, um, you're summing up some, it's a kind of divergence, so you're summing up some entries of this matrix, and it directly says that this condition is satisfied. Okay, so um, this is the local picture of a, of a normal crossings log symplectic manifold. Um, so now let's look at the Poisson cohomology. So uh, to analyze that, it's convenient to introduce these uh, logarithmic vector fields, which are the vector fields tangent to the divisor. So this is a locally free subsheaf in the tangent sheaf. And using that, you can construct a filtration on the poly vector fields, uh, whose smallest part is the, is the exterior algebra on the logarithmic vector fields, and whose biggest part is the whole poly vector fields. And then there are things in between. So if you've seen the, the weight filtration on the logarithmic differential forms in Hodge theory, uh, this is somehow the OX dual of that construction. Uh, it's easy to see that uh, this filtration is compatible with the Poisson differential. So when we take the associated graded, what we get is a complex. So in particular, if I take uh, WJ mod WJ minus one, I get a complex which has a very nice description. It turns out to be a direct sum over co-dimension J strata of a kind of Poisson cohomology of the, of the stratum, but a logarithmic version and twisted by some coefficients, which is a, a Poisson connection on the determinant of the normal bundle. Okay. So the Jth graded part of the, the Poisson complex decomposes as a direct sum of uh, contributions which come from the co-dimension J strata. So let me call these complexes CS just uh, for short. So each co-dimension J stratum has a, has, a, has a complex which is supported on it. And the theorem is the following. So let's suppose that we have a log symplectic manifold with a normal crossings divisor then first of all, we can completely characterize holonomicity in this case. It's equivalent to the conjecture that we had, which is that uh, the characteristic leaves, uh, the number of them is locally finite. Okay. So this picture of having finitely many symplectic leaves to which the modular vector field is tangent, that's exactly the situation of holonomicity, provided that you assume the divisor is normal crossings. Outside of that, we still don't know what's going on, but at least in the normal crossings case, the conjecture is true. Uh, and moreover, uh, we have a very concrete understanding of the cohomology in terms of quite topological things. 
So uh, if we assume holonomicity, then um, these complexes on strata have a very simple description. So um, what we can do is look at the open part of the stratum where everything is nice. And there the zeroth cohomology sheaf of this complex turns out to be uh, either trivial, in which case actually the whole cohomology is trivial, or the other possibility is that it's non-trivial but uh, because it's coming from a kind of complex, which is like a logarithmic Durham complex with coefficients in a flat line bundle, uh, it turns out to be a rank one local system on this open stratum. So there are only two possibilities for what this thing can actually be. Uh, on, these, uh, on these open strata, it's either trivial or it's uh, a rank one local system. And so when you, uh, sort it all out, what happens is that the associated graded of the Poisson complex decomposes as a direct sum over the characteristic symplectic leaves of uh, some push forwards of rank one local systems on strata. Um, so I've got a funny notation here, um, RJ star NR. This is not quite the ordinary push forward of this local system in general. There's some uh, resonance conditions which can screw up the comparison between the ordinary push forward and this actual complex. Um, but in any case, you should think of this as something like the, the ordinary derived push forward of this local system. In many cases, it's just the same. Um, so one immediate corollary which you can read from that result is that if you have a, a holonomic normal crossings situation, at least away from some subset of co-dimension four, then you can control the deformation space. So the, the second Poisson cohomology, the hypercohomology, decomposes as a direct sum of two pieces. The first piece um, is the, the contribution which comes from the open symplectic leaf. And it's just the ordinary topological cohomology of that open symplectic leaf. So this corresponds to the fact that we can uh, deform the Poisson structure simply by keeping the normal crossings divisor and deforming this uh, logarithmic two form. Okay. And those deformations are clearly unobstructed because they just involve uh, moving a uh, two form in its cohomology class. So these are the normal crossings deformations. And then um, there are additional contributions, but they can only appear from co-dimension two strata because of the degrees. And so these additional contributions are exactly uh, the global sections of this funny derived push forward. Um, so whatever this is, uh, when it's non-zero, it's just the ordinary global sections of this rank one local system. And so what you see is that the dimension of the deformation space, uh, well, it's the sum of two things. There's the second Betty number of the open symplectic leaf, which is the dimension of H2. And then, um, Whenever you find a co-dimension two stratum where this local system has a global section with no poles, uh, this uh, sum and in the cohomology turns on, it becomes non-zero and it becomes a one dimensional vector space. So every time that happens, you get an additional contribution to the cohomology. So when that occurs for some stratum, we, we say that the stratum is smoothable because those are exactly the deformations which correspond to taking an intersection of normal crossings divisors and smoothing it out. So that's the whole picture of the deformations. You can deform the two form and you can smooth out certain of the co-dimension two strata, but not all of them. Uh, Brent, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, is the holonomicity essential for this corollary? I think Assumption. we need it away from co-dimension four, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, this now gives us a fairly clear picture of what's going on in the moduli space. So I want to think of it in the following way. So we have this log symplectic form omega, and let me consider its cohomology class, which as I've stressed, controls a huge amount of information about the, the deformation theory. So, so here's a picture of the cohomology of some uh, normal crossings divisor, okay? And the symplectic form has a class which is inside here. And actually everything only depends on this class of the rescaling. So I'm gonna draw the projective space rather than the actual vector space. 
So as I move around in the cohomology, um, generically what's going on is that I'm in this white region and there um, all of these local systems have no flat sections. So there are no smoothable strata and the, the cohomology is just H2 of the open part. Okay, and so this is actually a picture of the deformation space of the Poisson manifold. I can just move in H2. But then what can happen is that uh, if I tune the, the periods of the symplectic form, then I can run into certain um, subspaces in the cohomology where suddenly one of the strata becomes smoothable. So it, it exhibits a, a flat section. Um, so I've represented that by these gray lines. And so the number, if you, if you look at a point here, then the number of smoothable strata is the number of lines which is passing through that point. So here I've got one smoothable stratum. Um, here I've got uh, two smoothable strata because there are two lines intersecting. And then these colored dots, the red, blue, and green dots, which I fit there, those have three smoothable strata, three lines intersecting at a point. And what happens is uh, these, uh, these gray lines, those all correspond to um, a situation where some ir other irreducible component of the moduli space, it comes and it hits the locus of normal crossing structures. So this is a picture of the locus of normal crossing structures and there are other components which shoot off from certain parts of it, which you can detect by the presence of these smoothable strata. Um, and uh, actually in some good cases, for instance, when there's toric symmetry, we have a very precise control over even the higher order obstructions. So this is a, actually quite an ex exact picture of the moduli space. Uh, what we can show is, for instance, in the toric case, the deformations are governed by uh, a formal DG Lie algebra. So that means that all of the obstructions vanish beyond order two. Uh, in fact, it has a very special and explicit form, which lets us deduce that the neighborhood of uh, this Poisson manifold in the moduli space actually has a very concrete description. It's a union of linear subspaces in this vector space, modded out by the linear action of a torus semi-direct product of finite group. So um, you can read off explicitly what are the different subspaces that are intersecting. Those are the different components of the moduli space, which contain this point x pi. Um, and we have a quite concrete description. So let me just close um, with an example to, to show you that all of this abstract machinery actually has very concrete uh, results. So if we look at the projective space P2N, um, if we have a simple normal crossings log symplectic structure, it turns out that the degeneracy divisor always has to be projectively equivalent to the union of the coordinate hyperplanes. So the divisor has uh, two n plus one components. They're given by the vanishing of the coordinates x, i. And you can write the log symplectic form very concretely in terms of homogeneous coordinates. It's just a sum of the, these, uh, these periods, b, i, j, times the, the d logs. And so then you can ask the question, when is a co-dimension two stratum smoothable? So when does it produce a non-trivial contribution to the second cohomology? Uh, well, the first condition is that it needs to be a characteristic symplectic leaf. So in particular, the Poisson structure has to be non-degenerate, which in terms of the bi-residues just translates into the fact that the corresponding bi-residue is non-zero. And then you have to ask, when does this uh, local system have a flat section? That again turns into a condition on, the, on these periods, which is a kind of uh, integrality condition. You take a particular combination of them, it needs to be a, a non-negative integer. So now this is a completely explicit thing. You have some skew symmetric matrix. You have a bunch of conditions which tell you when the smoothable strata turn on. You can just stick it into a computer and figure out what the possibilities are. So here's a theorem with the aid of a computer. Um, if we do this for P4, then what we find are that there are 40 different possibilities for the configurations of smoothable strata. Um, and so what we find is that the moduli space of Poisson structures, it has 40 irreducible components, uh, which corresponds to holonomic Poisson structures on P4 that can be degenerated to a normal crossings divisor. So um, here are some examples. We have a kind of a 
pictorial calculus for indexing these different components of the moduli space by colorings of a pentagon. Um, so the fagan odesky structures Q51 and Q52 on P4, those uh, both have toric degenerations, so they fall into this setup. Those correspond to two of these 40 irreducible components, which are very far from being normal crossings. They're, they have some kind of elliptic singularities. Uh, and they have an irreducible degeneracy divisor. And then there are three other components which correspond to irreducible degeneracy divisors. As far as I know, those are all new examples of Poisson structures on P4. And indeed, most of the 40 components, as far as I'm aware, are new. Okay, so with that uh, punchline, I'll thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, are there any questions? Um, can I just, I'm going to, I have the slides without the pauses, so I'm going to switch to those now so that um, it's easier to scroll back and forth if I need to. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, you talked about smooth uh, Poisson manifolds. To what extent this extends to the case of singular ones? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we have a we have a kind of idea how to extend this to singular varieties. Um, the problem with singular varieties is that it's a little bit less clear how to interpret the modular vector field without some constraints on the singularities, like maybe Gornstein. Um, but if you look at the, um, the appropriate Poisson cohomology, which would involve the tangent complex, then we think we have a strategy for establishing finite dimensionality along similar lines. Does that, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, and so this would subsume the theory from the papers of uh, Ittingoff Schedler. Well, those were dealing with Poisson homology, um, which curiously behaves quite differently when the manifold is smooth. So the Poisson homology, uh, as soon as the Poisson structure has any degeneracy, the Poisson homology always has infinite dimensional stocks. So the Poisson cohomology behaves uh, more finite than the homology. So it doesn't subsume the stuff in your paper. Um, but it, it, might, um, it might fit in with this work of Namikawa on the deformations of symplectic singularities. I think Alejandro has a question. Nikita, can you deal with it? <laughs> with with sure. the raised hands? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks, Brent, for the talk. I have a, just a question. Do you know if the, this characteristic uh, Lagrangian variety has any significance to quantization of the That's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, no, I have I have no idea. <laughs> it's uh, it's somehow tied up with the uh, the dualizing complex of the non-commutative variety, but I don't I don't really know what to say about it. Hi. Okay. There's also a question from Anna. Hi, uh, Brent. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was wondering um, are all polynomial. Sorry, I missed that. Are all holonomic manifolds log symplectic? Or no? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so holonomic, uh, it, it implies log symplectic, uh, it's, but it's a stronger condition, um, which somehow has something to do with the singularities in higher co-dimension, which, which you don't see when you only look at the degree of the poles of the symplectic form. Mm -hmm. so, so that was somehow the thing which I had struggled with for a long time was the deformations of log symplectic manifolds where you allow the divisor to be singular, I couldn't get any control on them. And it seemed to be that the reason is that we were missing this, uh, this more subtle issues about the singularities and high co-dimension. So, so your theorem says that, that a manifold is polynomic if and only if it's log symplectic and has a uh, locally finite number of characteristic leaves. Is that true? 
So um, that's the conjectural picture. I, I mean the theorem on slide 14. On oh, 14, yeah. So uh, yeah, the normal crossings case, that's exactly what's going on. Um, so uh, w when I say, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. I see, but, but you'll, you'll, potentially you have log symplectic things where the, the divisor is worse than normal crossings. There are lots of those, exactly. Um, okay. Thank and uh, the question is when, when those are holonomic, <laughs> we expect that this characterization is probably still the correct one, but we don't know. Thank you. But, 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 but I guess that for the purposes of the, um, you know, the H2 and the classical deformation theory, we wouldn't need it to be normal crossings everywhere. Just yeah, that, that you need it only away from some, from some uh, what's co-dimension four locus, I think. So, so already that's a constraint because there are lots of examples which are not normal crossings in co-dimension three, but, um, but yeah. And I should also say that there, there's some issue. Um, one of the reasons why normal crossings divisors are important in algebraic geometry is that you can always, if you have any hypersurface, you can always blow it up enough times to produce a normal crossings divisor. So it's a Hironaka resolution of singularities. But unfortunately, blobs do not interact all that well with Poisson structures. Um, so you can't you can't resolve the singularities of the degeneracy divisor for a Poisson manifold in the same way. There's a question from Marco. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, maybe uh, the first one should be uh, from your last slide. Can you explain the pentagons? Yeah. So. Um, in general, if you have a normal crossings divisor, there's a dual simplicial complex whose vertices are labeled by the irreducible components of the divisor. So here, oh, oops, I had a scratch pad. Um, let me, I'm sorry, just a second. So, um, right, so if I, uh, this pentagon, it has five uh, vertices and those five vertices uh, correspond to the five components of the divisor. Okay. And then you join the vertex vertices, you've joined a pair of vertices by an edge if, uh, if they intersect. So in, in projective space, all intersections are there. So, so x0, x4 equals zero gives a co-dimension two stratum, which corresponds to this edge of the pentagon. And so what we do is we, uh, we color, so the edges correspond to co-dimension two strata, and we color the, an edge red if the corresponding stratum is smoothable in the sense that this local system has a non-trivial section. Um, and then um, there's some additional information which is encoded by these angles, uh, which has to do with precisely what integer is appearing here in this, uh, is like the residue of a certain connection. Um, so the, this uh, coloring encodes the, the order at which the flat section vanishes along certain components of the boundary divisor of the, the co-dimension two stratum. So uh, we were able to find a whole bunch of combinatorial constraints which, which severely limit the possibilities for these diagrams, although we don't have a complete characterization, but we got it down far enough that it was easy to get a computer to, to just run and spit out all the possibilities. Okay, so, um, so this one here, it has five smoothable strata. And what happens is when you deform, uh, well, the intersection of X0 and X1 gets smoothed out. So those two things get joined to become a single irreducible component, but they also get joined with X2 and X3 and X4. So the connected components of, or, so the irreducible components of the deformed divisor, they correspond to the connected components of this red graph. And there's a kind of, Nicole has done a very nice job of, uh, explaining essentially the entire structure of the deformation just by reading off some properties of these pictures. Okay, thanks. And the second question I had was, uh, do I understand correctly that, uh, that uh, this whole uh, setup could be applied in a similar way to Dirac structures? Yeah, I think that's right. And so I'm just wondering if there's something, if you can see something, I mean, from the point of view of uh, holonomic D modules, 
is there something special about the uh, complex uh, that you get from uh, Poisson structures? You know, the fact that it has this um, Lie bialgebroid structure rather than just being a, a differential graded uh, algebra? Yeah, I wish I had a clear answer as to what what is special about it that makes it tractable. Um, the modular vector field, as you saw, is somehow a key feature. Um, and that is somehow tied up with the the the, uh, the bi-algebroid structure because, uh, you know, that's also to do with the BV structure. Um, but I don't quite see the precise thing. Um, on the other hand, what I can say is that you can use this formalism of D modules to analyze cohomology of other Lie algebroids or even L infinity algebroids. And you can get various statements like if you look at their representations at the homotopy of a L infinity algebroid with only finitely many orbits, then that will always be a constructible sheaf like this. So you can get finiteness um, for, for more general Lie algebroids. It's not necessarily something special to Poisson math. Okay, thanks. There's a question from uh, Rui. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for the talk, it was beautiful. Um, I have a question about the, it's probably related with uh, what Ale was asking. This characteristic variety uh, in the holonomic case, is, is it a least subalgebroid of the cotangent bundle? I should probably check that. So I, I, I mean, what the reason I'm asking is, can you recognize holonomicity by looking at the symplectic groupoid? Because you are, you are dealing with things that are integrable mm -hmm. and you are looking at things which are special inside these log symplectic right, things. Yeah. And this looks like if it is a least subalgebra, it means that you have like some kind of Lagrangian subgroupoid in there. That's right, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll bet any money that it's a least subalgebroid, but I, I haven't checked it. I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, I have no idea what the holonomicity corresponds to um, in terms in of terms the groupoid, of, uh, other than, as you say, it would, would indeed give a Lagrangian. But uh, maybe so. there is some geometric meaning to it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that would be um, nice. Yeah. The, the other thing, um, it's kind of like orthogonal to your talk, but... <laughs> So you could look at holomorphic uh, Poisson structures um, like the dual of a simple complex Lie algebra. Mm -hmm. Those don't don't they have also simple deformations, uh, trivial deformations even? Yeah, sure. So if you look like at the, at the holomorphic thing, uh, a holomorphic Poisson structure that on the, along the singular the, along the the singular locus transversally, it's always of that form. Um, does any of these methods apply there? Um, not out of the box, certainly. Um, so th the basic problem there is that the symplectic leaves are not, you know, the generic symplectic leaves are not dense, right? So it's right. quite far from being holonomic, but, yes. but nevertheless, you could, you know, maybe not throw your hands up so quickly and say, well, okay, the thing has a leaf space and uh, morally a Poisson manifold is some kind of vibration of symplectic manifolds over its leaf space. So, so maybe like the fibers of the projection to the leaf space are somehow holonomic. And so you get something weaker than uh, a perverse sheaf, but it would be like constructible or it would be coherent on the leaf space or something like this. Mm -hmm. And maybe one could, one could do something like that. We, we've only thought about that very, very roughly and don't have any concrete statements to make. Okay, C could I just uh, add to that, that even in the case when you're generically symplectic, I think you check, Brent, right, that they're not in general holonomic, right? So, uh, I mean, as we see already for normal crossings, it's, uh, it's not the case. I, I mean, for the dual of a Lie algebra. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. So you can look at uh, Lie algebras whose duals are um, uh, generically symplectic. Th those do right. exist. They're not simple Lie algebras, but there are some other right. ones which are right. called Frobenius Lie algebras. And uh, even for most of those, they're not holonomics. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, my question was going in the up in different yeah. direction. Was when like the, the analog of you know compacts in this holomorphic world. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great question. What is the analog of a Poisson manifold of compact type in yeah. the holomorphic setting? And um, it, it seems a bit tricky because um, you know the uh, the structure of the the stabilizer Lie algebras is no longer that they're always the Lie algebra of a compact Lie group. Um, yeah. So they wouldn't be a Lie algebra of reductive yeah. uh, group. Right? Yeah. So okay, thank you. So it's a bit unclear what the condition is supposed to be. Um, there's a question from Sam Evans. You, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yep. Hi, Brent. Lovely talk. Um, Good to see you. Um, I just wanted to point out relative to the last discussion that there's uh, that any um, any conjugacy class in a complex semi-simple Lie group has uh, has a generically symplectic Poisson structure. This came out of the stuff Lou and I did on Lagrangian subalgebras. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's very unlikely that it's, it's ever um, log symplectic, mm -hmm. but maybe there's still something one could try to say. Okay, you should look at those, thanks. Yeah, so any, any further questions? Yeah, I have a question also. Uh, so uh, in, in some cases when you can compute the deformation space, like for example, Hilbert schemes of surfaces, uh, do, you, uh, do you see that these deformations are unabstracted and can you compute uh, non, uh, like, uh, non, not just first order, but actual deformations? Um, yeah, so the normal crossings case, we somehow understand things at all orders. The Hilbert schemes, there are some unobstructedness results previously due to uh, Hitchin and Ran. Um, I guess in the symplectic case, that was uh, much older, that's Bogomolov. Um, we haven't worked out those examples in enough detail to recover the unobstructedness yet, but we're, it's something we're working on. Um, so, so, uh, so Eric Rains uh, constructed some Poisson structures uh, uh, which are of this sort for oh, yeah the, these uh, these things coming from non commutative surfaces yeah right. yeah and so yeah, maybe you can see them uh, yeah and another question I had this bij so they un end up being integers up to scaling uh, when they satisfy your conditions at the last slide uh, yeah I think that's correct Mikola do you want to well, it's the it's the fraction there that's the integer, I guess. Yeah, the, the fraction of the integer, but then ah, right. But, like, but is it true that you said that there are forty cases? So I suppose that means that the that it follows that they're they're all integers up to some rescaling. No, no, it's, it, it, those things can vary. It's this combinatorial picture here which is governing, a, and then you have a component which you can have. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, but I think it's still true that that when you um, when you tune the the parameters to get these different pictures, it still turns out that these these uh, periods are all uh, somehow integral to rescaling. Yeah. So if uh, so, each edge imposes like two equations, and there are six uh, parameters in this case. So if you have uh, three or more equations, meaning three or more. Uh, red edges, then basically numbers are determined up to a scalar and you just can choose the scalar so that they are all integers. If it's two or one edge, then some of them can, you have uh, three parameters. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? If it's not the case, then I would say let's thank the speaker again. Thanks, everyone.